and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest is Abbott Philip Anderson, OSB. He's here to talk about the book Light and Strength, Mother Cecile Bruyere, and it's published by Abbey Editions. It's welcome. Great Glad to, to be have here, here. here. Thanks. Excellency. Thanks for having me. Um, now, this particular book, you didn't write this book, did you? I didn't write the book. There was a Benedictine monk who was a chaplain in Vermont, and he was quite an author and wrote biographies of saints. And he had written this, and I knew this would be a good thing if we could get it into English mm -hmm. for a lot of people in America. And so we worked on it for quite a while and did a translation, and edited, and worked on it. But instead of finding a, a publisher, we sort of decided to go into the micro-publishing trend and to do it ourselves, uh, and that's what we did, and we were pretty happy with the result. And that's kind of like an on-demand thing, right? An on-demand thing. Well, well, we'll try to market it in our little way, but without right. letting the middleman take all the right. profits and, and sort of getting it out of our hands, we're going to keep it. Now, is this the first book you've, you've done this like this? This is the this? first one. We're, we're, we're calling it Abbey Editions. We want to do several like this related to our life, not just you know anything, just books having to do with monastic life right. that we think that you know a certain public will really appreciate a, a quality you know uh, product, I guess you might say. Mm. And so this is the first one. First one. Now let me ask you. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? The book obviously was translated from, uh, from French. It, it's talking about what ha uh, I found us, uh, Mother Cecile Bruyere, who's first abbess of uh, Saint Cecile of Salem, obviously in France. Uh, you don't quite sound like you're no, from no. France. No, no. So well, tell us your little bit about your background. With, it starts with the University of Kansas, of all places, and a group of students studying great books who became interested in the Catholic faith. It's mm -hmm. kind of a big story. But uh, some of us really uh, became Catholics. We, we really wanted to do something with this faith. This mm -hmm. is in the time of the 70s of campus revolution, you know, all sorts of ideas. And someone said, well, why don't you go to France and find a really ancient abbey where you know there's going to be this, 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 this uh, deep religious life that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And we did, and it happened to be part of a family that's called the Salem family, a group of monasteries, Benedictines. These are contemplative monks who don't have schools or anything else. They're just the rule of St. Benedict, prayer, study, silence. And so we, we lived there for some, you know, 20, I was there for 24 years mm -hmm. with the idea of coming back to America and starting a monastery of that type. It's not too well represented in America. We have a lot of Benedictines, very fine places who but they run schools, universities, mm -hmm. and they have a sort of different life that uh, really did well uh, for a while with a lot of uh, vocations are a little bit waning. And mm -hmm. I don't know, we were just interested in something else, this mm -hmm. kind of getting back to the contemplative life. And so we loved it over there. It worked, and, and, a, and a lot of Americans went over there. Mm -hmm. There's some women, too, who went over and became nuns. And a certain nucleus of us remained through it all. Studies became priests and came back in 1999 mm -hmm. and looked all over America and we found in Oklahoma was the most, well, a lot of our friends are in the Midwest. We've had doctors and lawyers. The bishop wanted us to come and mm -hmm. it just seemed like the right place. So what diocese of, did it end diocese up Diocese of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay. Okay. This is kind of the foothills of the Who was the, the bishop Ozarks. at the time or is it? Uh, Edward Slattery, oh, Slattery, Slattery, Bishop okay. Slattery right. of Tulsa. Great man. He right. really wanted us to come. Mm -hmm. Sometimes bishops will just tolerate you because, <laughs> because they see it as a, because we're not under the jurisdiction of the bishop. Right. We, we have a, our own hierarchy that goes up to the pope through the religious order. But of course, you, you have to work with the diocese. We, we right. had a charter. We agreed on how this would all work. Right. And so there we are. We, we went. It's kind of there and back again. We went off to France and mm -hmm. you know, got the religious life and came back. So how many of you actually came back? Did you come back as a group I then? think there's 13. There were, no, we came back as a, as a family with French and Canadians and Americans. Okay. It wasn't, it wasn't just... Uh, we wasn't Americans. just the Americans. No, no, who went over we and came, came with back. a regular foundation from this Foncombeau Abbey, where we had entered, which is 900 years old and really quite a place for Americans. You know the the poetry of it, just the beauty of this place, this huge Romanesque church and the chant really enthralled us. That's what we wanted to bring back somehow to America. Okay. And so and 13 came back mm -hmm. in 1999, and now we're about 44. 44. And, and is it my understanding, uh, were you, are you a convert or were you part I'm of I'm a convert, group? yes. Okay. I was the wildest, uh, you know, I was a hippie, hippie sort of, <laughs> you know. 
But so in, my, my generation, was, in, in, my, in my generation, it was either heaven or hell. We weren't going to just get a good job. I mean, right, some right. of us, it was going to be, it was pretty much hell for a while. And then now it's heaven. I think it's a much better choice. Right. There's, a more, <laughs> there's more future, you know, in this uh, sort of radicalism. But, it, you know, I always sort of wanted something radical. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, you know, the, here we go. I didn't know of a radical vision of Christianity before I had studied at the university and met John Senior, who was, he became my uh, godfather actually. He really presented us a view of the faith that was extremely interesting. And mm -hmm. you know, we had you know, just many converts. Two bishops came out. Our archbishop now, who was in Oklahoma City, was one of those students. Uh, bishop Conley, right, Conley was one of them mm -hmm. who baptized his own parents once he became a priest. So it was, uh, there's some miracles of grace there. I think it was what theologians might call an actual grace. You know, mm -hmm. you know there's sanctifying grace, habitual grace you have when you frequent the sacraments and you're baptized. And then God just sometimes zaps people. There's, there's a sort of a mm -hmm. moment, there was a moment there which went beyond what the professors had even imagined. And, and there was just all these right. conversions and these things. It was quite a wonderful thing. When you went there and you were there for 24 years, I'm assuming you didn't go there thinking you might be there for 24 years. Did it take that long to inculcate what needed to be brought back? Or what was it that led you to believe that now was the time to come back? Well, you see, they said you can enter here, but you have to stay here the rest of your life and die here if that's necessary. We might not make a foundation. The monks didn't make us any promises. I just always thought this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, There were years when it looked like it might not because there were no more Americans coming over, but I always thought it would happen. And so mm -hmm. we were ready to stay the rest of our lives and die there, you know, because that's, it's not about coming home to America. It wasn't the main objective. It's mm -hmm. serving God. It's, you know, it's like a Holocaust. You're giving your life up. So that's the main thing, to become a monk. But we did, on the level of just more of a human understanding, thought we would come back someday. It would make sense to come back to America. Okay. Let's talk about... Uh, kind of gives us an idea and that's a platform for understanding. We've got light and strength, Mother Cecile Bruyere, first abbess of St. Cecile of Salem. And there's also another important figure in this book that is very prominent, Dom Garanger. Yes. And uh, tell us about those two and why they're important. Well, Dom Garanger, people know him through questions of liturgy because he was a pretty famous figure in liturgical movement, the first liturgical movement, there have been others in, in uh, the liturgical reform of Vatican II is in very much contact with this idea of liturgical renewal or whatever that really started with Don Guéranger. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the French Revolution, you know, at the end of the 18th century, mm -hmm. all the religious orders are massacred, just have to go into exile, priests being killed, nuns being, you know, the guillotine. And then when all that was over, there was a rebirth in France of Christianity. The blood of the martyrs just brought back a, an incredible richness of Catholic life in the 19th century. Don Guéranger is one of the first figures. There's La Cordaire for the Dominicans. There was just everything was, and he was a central figure that knew all these people. And he had lived near a little priory that was abandoned. Near he, he grew up near the Salem Priory was abandoned. And he always dreamed of bringing that back to life. <coughs> So he became a priest and eventually got permission with some other young priests to, to live in there. Mm -hmm. It was about 1833. And it, it flourished and became the mother house of a kind of a, a congregation, a whole you know, series of, of monasteries in this renewal you know, that happened in the 19th century. And he wasn't thinking of starting a monastery of nuns, but this came up. Mm -hmm. And he was directing a young girl, Jenny Bruyere, yeah, for didn't her, he start working with her when she was like 11 or something? She was 12. Uh, okay. She needed to do her first communion and it wasn't confirmed yet. And her family, which was in Paris, decided to move out to the country and they just happened to be located near the Salem mm -hmm. Abbey. <clears throat> By then, she was born in 1845, so it was quite a bit later in Don Guéranger's career. He was getting older. But he directed her. She wanted to make a vow of perpetual chastity at 16. Mm -hmm. And he had the courage to accept that. Her father was quite against her becoming a nun, but at mm -hmm. the age of 21, the very day I think she left home and came and became the abbess of a feminine branch with several young women from various she parts of France. By 25 she was, right? Yeah, I mean, she, she, was 
She was actually abbess before they were, they were in an abbey. Okay. And they said in Rome, that's really putting the cart before <laughs> the horse. But we'll make, you know, they had asked the special privilege, Don Guillaume to make her abbess, even though her little monastery wasn't an abbey yet. And she became an abbess at a very young age, you know. But she was very tough, I think, that light and strength. She was very, first, very intellectual. He taught her to read the fathers, and she was very. And that's how he described her, right? <coughs> It's just uh, a title that the author mm -hmm. gave, mm -hmm. you know, in French, Lumière et Force. And you just look at her portrait on the front cover of this, you know, it's just someone who, she's determined to do what she's going to do, and she was a strong leader and always just a perfect, you know, person yeah. for the job. And the other pictures that show her when she was growing up with her and her sister, you can see that same expression well, in she, her face. She right? had a problem with temper and in everything, and, and Don Guéranger taught her to, to master that, to uh, to learn to overcome her, her tendency to be very, very, you know, strict she, and Did she get that angry. from her father? Because I, I don't, some I don't know. about her father's the, the, the wrath, I know, in the book. He was, right? a, he was a rather famous architect in their family. They are architects. And he was, very, yeah, he, he got very mad. Mm -hmm. But at the end, he did calm down and, and finally accepted her vocation and, and, and died, you know. But he was, he was really determined not to let her become a nun. It seems to happen a lot in life mm -hmm. with the... <laughs> St. Francis' father wasn't too happy either. If right, you remember, right. you know, the to go up all seems to happen. And, gave him everything, right? <clears throat> and, and us, we converts, not in every case, but in many cases, there was some real trouble us, about us going to France for the rest of our lives, becoming, you know, Catholics and everything. The parents thought, well, you know, this is just another phase, or this right, is a bad right, phase. Right. This one is really. This is the, an alternative to joining a community in the United this States. Is, yeah. so it's Becoming a hippie there, was right. bad, but this was going right. to really be bad, you know. Right. But most of the parents re did reconcile. When they saw it's what we really, really wanted, this is mm -hmm. what we wanted to do, and they saw it wasn't just a passing phase, well, then they began to take it seriously. And the positive fruits of that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah it was. It's been great. It's been very great. Did that prompt conversions in your family or just an acceptance? In my family, not quite yet, but uh, I've had some of the family members who I thought were sort of against me finally came out. They said, well, yeah, we're really happy you did that. And we, right. I find support in my family. And there had been conversions in some of the families. He says here in the book, he's, he's talking about uh, the spiritual education founded on an equilibrium and common sense aimed at bringing to full fruition the abundant supernatural gifts that he had discerned in this chosen soul. He insisted in particular on, on docility to the will of God and the need to quiet and control her temperament, like we, we alluded that, to, yeah. which could be characterized as strong and independent. Yeah, well, she, that's, that's the way it is in life sometimes. The, the, the thing that's most your, your, your difficulty becomes your strength if you can, you can master it like, you know, a, a strong horse, you know, a very, very strong horse. If you can keep it in control, well, then it becomes a very great asset. So she was the right person <coughs> for this. But she was also very intellectual. There's mm -hmm. the light part. She, she wrote a book on, on prayer, <coughs> you know, that we also make available through our, our bookstore or online, or whatever. And uh, the spiritual life. It has a longer title, and it's quite unique. And it was it had many editions published in France, you know. And when she began at Solem, uh, other monasteries started looking to Solem to renew or to start over again. They had uh, many families of the of the Habsburg family came to become nuns there, and mm -hmm. they had the you know right. Empress Zita would come to Salem, and, and and so they right. From they, the they found she found herself families, at the right. center of, uh, of attention in Europe of mm -hmm. a, a pretty incredible you know and so that's another reason why the life is interesting. Many people involved here you know uh, in Europe. In America, we have in Canada a men's monastery and a women's uh, abbey of this congregation, mm -hmm. and in Vermont uh, there is a, a monastery, mm -hmm. Immaculate Heart, that is directly, you know, uh, from uh, Madame Cécile Bouillère. In the olden days they called the abbess Madame, Madame mm -hmm. Labesse, mm -hmm. you know. Now, you know, Lady Abbess, now it's just Mother Abbess. Oh. And they were involved with helping w uh, with the production of this book, right, or the translation, I think? They did. They, they were invaluable in the help right? in reviewing it all and helping us, uh, you know, come up with a, make a, a nice addition, a nice addition. Now, it says here, and I thought, the contemplative life to which she was called from her youth would always be for her, quite simply, an anticipation of the beatific vision. Just as participation in the liturgy was always for her a foretaste of the liturgy that is celebrated in heaven. Wow, yeah, that's in a chapter of her book on the spiritual life. She talks about the liturgy 
as just the same on earth and in heaven. The Orthodox have a very similar intuition. I don't think she got that idea because in those days there wasn't much knowledge of Orthodox liturgy, you know, Eastern rites. Mm -hmm. But you know, <coughs> if you go back to the Gospel, of course, where all these things are rooted, in the Gospel of St. John in chapter 4, where you see the Lord, you see Jesus doing evangelization alone because the apostles had gone off to buy supplies or something and he's all by himself, you know, with the Samaritan woman. You see his, you see other moments you know, with Nicodemus, whatever, but here it's a, a really important moment. And so when he gets to the essential of this discourse with the woman at, at the, uh, well, as we get past her personal history, that was kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. okay, but you, get to the, you get to the essential, he's talking about, you know, the Father looking for those who adore in spirit and truth. You know, there you have the heart of this contemplative idea, mm -hmm. you know, and if you want to evangelize, you have to first have that. You know, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, blessed, you know, would have this time of contemplation in the morning before going out in the streets. Mm -hmm. And so, if everyone is going to have a contemplative base to what they do, well, some people have to do it all the time. You have to have carbon light nuns, for example, right. or these Benedictine nuns, you know, have a contemplative life with a particular, a special component being the liturgy, the mm -hmm. official prayer of the church. Since Vatican II, we know how important that is. I don't know that it's in great shape sometimes, the liturgy, but we all know how important it is. And so that was her, her, her spirituality is con contemplation, but especially focusing on the prayers of the church, using that as the basis rather than devotions or whatever, which of course the nuns have too, we have too, mm -hmm. but to really enter into the liturgy, Pope Paul VI wanted the Benedictines to keep the Latin and Gregorian mm -hmm. chant, you know, and uh, I know the Archbishop who's in head of, ahead of, uh, the head of the new evangelization is said too that, you know, we Benedictines should, should keep Gregorian chant in Latin. So there, there you have it, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. living the liturgy in the language of the church. Everybody can't do that, but some people can. And with a focus, with, with a particular accent on the liturgy, which was the great genius of Don Guéranger. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the preface, it's mentioned here that uh, May the pages of this biography unfold for the reader the beauty and fullness of an existence that never had any purpose other than other to remain always and entirely ready before the presence of God. What, what do you mean ready before the presence of God? Ready for what? Anything? Or? Well, um, you know, the fundamental intuition of St. Benedict, mm -hmm. who not only founded the Benedictine order, but really monasticism in the Western world. There was the Irish tradition, which was very big, but the Benedictine rule for centuries was the only thing that really uh, was the reference for all the monks. And uh, it's all based on, <coughs> well, th the goal for everyone is the perfection of charity. Mm -hmm. But for the monk as such, his means is obedience. And not only obedience, go take this pail of sand and take it over there to execute like a soldier, but. Mm -hmm which you might call obedience of judgment or just docility, being mm -hmm. docile to God. You know, how often we want, we sort of know what God wants us to do, and we just don't want to do it. Well, the nun or the monk has to learn to be docile and ready to do, mm -hmm. you know, ecce, you know, our monastery is dedicated to Our Lady of the Annunciation, you know, and there you have the perfect two words, ecce fiat, ecce, here, here I am, you know, uh, the mother of God. I mean, how uh, difficult, you know, this is, a perspective would just would just, you know, people would be, you know, you can't ex something so hard, but be be ready. The blessed virgin is there ready to accept that, and then fiat, obedience. I'm going to obey this. I'm, I'm docile first. I'm going to l receive the message. Then I'm going to obey, you know. And that's really uh, at the heart of what the, the 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 religious every religious does, and in this. Spirituality of Lady Cécile Boyer, you, you get a particular accent. Right. Now, now, in chapter 14, near the end, uh, she's talking about uh, prepare your lamps, as the chapter says, the state which I described to you comes upon me unexpectedly without anything having occasioned it or prepared the way for it, and in the most diverse circumstances. And she says, exterior things become transparent to me. In an entirely spiritual matter that I cannot explain, I only know that everything brings me to God that is impossible to be distracted because that which is ordinarily a distraction becomes for me the means of union with our Lord. That's great. 
I like that. Right. I think I read it before, but I hadn't noticed. You've, you've, you've uh, pointed out some interesting texts here. Well, the true, the true contemplative, you know, and it could be a Carmelite, it could be a Carthusian monk, it could be a Trappist. Uh, if they lead this life of prayer long enough, uh, you know, y it gets to where it's sort of all the time, more than at a particular time, you know. We monks do a half an hour of mental prayer a day, but the Holy Spirit, you see, isn't on a schedule. He might want to visit you when you're doing the dishes, or he might want to, the, you know, there's this freedom in God. We show our fidelity by showing up at a certain time, but prayer can happen mm -hmm. anywhere, and it's so easy for God to make everything then appear in the light He wants you to see it, and then you see everything, whether mm -hmm. it's nature or another other human being, you, you, you all of a sudden begin to see right. everything. It doesn't last all the time because we, you know, we have the cross, we have to show our fidelity. We live in faith, we don't live in the vision, but the contemplative, the, the veil is lifted sometimes. St. John of the Cross speaks as if for him, at some point, it's almost like the veil is very, very thin. Mm -hmm. And for a contemplative, it can be that sometimes, and people all long for that. They say, well, how do you do that? Well, you know. Well, do you think that's even more important in the world we live in today where we're constantly inundated with information coming at us from 25 different ways? I mean, we live in a world of high distractibility. In fact, uh, we're so distractible that we, we might as well all have attention deficit, it seems, at times. I think you're, we're getting it. Yeah, the, right. the, the modern world is getting it all. Well, you see, part of that is just to get back to natural things, you know. Monasteries are often out in the, solid, in the solitude or out in the, in the country to just get away. And one thing for the modern man is to go to a monastery, and I don't mean for 24 hours, I mean, you know, for a few days, mm -hmm. and you will see this happen. You will see if you don't bring your cell phone with you or you turn it off or make a rule that I only look at it once a day or something, you will see this happen. The, the, the layers of things will kind of go away and then you will begin to enter into this. But to have this sort of uh, experience with God, you have to have a, lo a, a, a lot of prayer in your life. It's not a, something you can do on a weekend necessarily, but it can all happen and we all need that. We need to get away once in a while. And that's one thing that we can have as an apostle. Mm -hmm. We contemplative uh, monasteries allow guests to come and share in our life mm -hmm. for a few days. And it, it tra I've seen businessmen who are depressed who who don't know what to do in life, give them a wheelbarrow and they just come to life. Mm -hmm. they, they'll, they'll start working out in the garden or whatever and it's something, right. you know, and then they'll pray. And, and so, yeah, I think there's a, d in, in her, in this book and in the book she's written, there is a, there's a kind mm -hmm. of a, a path to... Uh, well, it's interesting too here because um, in, the, in the section on the two founders depart, when the good God calls me to himself, he told the num three years before his death, this is uh, Don Grange, mm -hmm. I will die in peace because I know in whose hands I am leaving you. She will hold all my thoughts. Whenever she speaks, you will be able to say, that is what our father Abbott would want. She has always been so docile to tell you, quite frankly, I don't believe she ever once resisted grace. May our Lord bless her for all the consolation she has given. So when, when we talk about her, is she an extension of him or does she add on to what he has provided her? Well, <clears throat> it's, it's interesting because this became very controversial at some point because he really said that it's kind of embarrassing to his monks that he said, well, this nun understands me better than you do. Now, Don Guéranger, when he started his monastery, it wasn't with all young men, it was priests and people who were around. And they were a, pretty, a crew of pretty original characters. And <laughs> he, had, he had some difficulty with these men. He hadn't formed them since they were 12 years old. And there were some saintly people, among the good people, but he, he has a rough time. And he was telling them that she is the one that really understands me. And, mm -hmm. and so when Don Guéranger died, Monks would come to kind of hear her wisdom. They would come to the parlor because she's a, she's a right, cloistered right. nun. They would have to come to the parlor and she would help them until a certain monk appeared. He was already a doctor in theology when he arrived, Don Delat. And once he was abbot, uh, she said, well, now I turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. But until then, she sort of had the flame. She was sort of the one that kept the right spirit going for the nuns, of course, mm -hmm. and for the monks in a certain way. Some found this to be uh, somewhat uh, inappropriate, and there was some concern sometime in Rome, but it all worked out. It found that she did nothing inappropriate. She was just Right, in fact, there was a part where she had to leave for a period of time? Or no, she didn't have to, but the 
there was Rome uh, asked the abbot who was there to stay away for a while and they had okay. a canonical visitation. They found there was nothing wrong whatsoever. Right. It all came back. Okay. That there was a crisis. Most institutes, if you study, will have a period of crisis at some point mm -hmm. in the beginning. You know, so it was a cross for the for this right. congregation. And but that crisis really wrecked her nerves. She never recovered physically. She was so stressed by all that that she never really recovered her health <coughs> from that. And uh, then, of course, they had to be in exile they, because of political things. France is a very political country. They, right. they, they, they have their ups and downs. They're quite extreme, and, it's and they had to leave. And you know, yeah, unfortunately, it still is today. Yeah. And we, uh, unfortunately, we we don't have the time to continue at this point French in time. So it's, it's, we're going to have to turn this over to people to find out That's the rest right. of the That's story. That's right. And it's to, all in the book. And to get the wisdom. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Doug. Abbott Great. for be being here, speaking with Abbott Philip Anderson, OSB, talking about a fine book, Light and Strength, and it's Mother Cécile Bruyère, first abbess of St. Cécile of Salem. It's uh, peaceful just reading this book. Check it out. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Book Club.